Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Gospodarik from Broadcom, and I'm here today with... Hi, I'm Org Elitz from Mellanox. And today we're going to talk about taking control of your smart NIC. So an important point to think about when we frame this conversation is what is a smart NIC? It's an often, often a confused term, and we wanted, thought it was important to define. So first of all, let's talk about what a smart NIC is not. It is not a NIC with, that only has fixed function hardware that might be capable of stateful or stateless offload. For example, VLAN, tunnel offload, flow offload might be found on a lot of network ASICs. This is not what we're calling a smart NIC. We're also not calling a smart NIC a NIC with a programmable data path written using a very specific language. For example, eBPF or P4, or maybe a hardware description language. These are not smart NICs. What we are talking about when we say a smart NIC is a, a device that allows a server operator or owner to move control plane applications directly to general purpose cores that live on this NIC or sometimes we might call it an SOC. In a practical sense today, this is exclusively ARM-based devices that Or and I will be talking about today. In the future, companies might choose to use RISC-V or other instruction sets, but the architecture primarily used today is, is ARM. So when you hear us say ARM or SOC, we're talking about those special cores that live directly on the net. We want to think about a previous presentation done at IETF 105 about how NICs work today, a presentation that was worked on by myself or Tom Herbert and Simon Horman. This smart NIC would fall into the category of a programmable NIC with a general purpose processor that, in this case, of course, at NetDev, runs Linux. In addition to being able to offload these, these control plane cores, of course, these are all part of the same family of chips that are available in the regular NICs that both Broadcom and Mellanox make. So in addition to control plane being offloaded to, to these ARM cores, we might actually be able to offload the data path to this fixed function ASIC as well. So there's a lot of, a lot of things happening on these devices, a lot of really cool things, a lot of really neat features we want to talk about and talk about how to manage them. One other key component to a smart NIC over a, a standard NIC, what some people in my company call a performance NIC, um, is that further packet processing through hardware offload capabilities like crypto, compression, maybe pattern matching. These, these could be applied to you know, Linux frameworks, kernel, uh, maybe DPDK, and, and NIC cores can offload those things using frameworks, those applications to frameworks available on this hardware. In many cases, what we're actually seeing is that fixed function devices are defined, are, excuse me, we're seeing is that fixed function devices are fairly limited right now in terms of their offload capabilities. We're seeing a rapid expansion in the offload capabilities and hardware assist abilities exclusively in what we're labeling today as smart NICs. If we talk about what the smart NIC architecture might look like, there's a fantastic presentation at SIGCOM last year that discussed uh, what a smart NIC might look like and what some of the units might be, the functional blocks that would be in that smart NIC. Obviously, we have a PCI card here, uh, excuse me, a PCI Express card here that has the ability to communicate over a PCI interface to a host. And included on that would be these computing units. Well, again, we're talking mostly about multi-core ARM processors, uh, accelerators that could be available for doing packet processing or assist with packet processing, crypto, compression, regex, et cetera. Some onboard memory that obviously these, these memory needs to be available for running an operating system and receiving and sending packets, and then possibly some traffic control infrastructure uh, or maybe an embedded switch. At this same SIGCOM presentation are some great pictures that describe two basic types of smart NIC. So we're going to call these, these the names that were used here were the on-path and the off-path smart NICs. We can see pictures of the architecture here. 
So we want to break these down and explain them in a little bit more detail. So the name, as you might surmise, comes from the fact that if it is an on-path smart NIC, the NIC cores are always on the packet path. So that means that any frames that come into the device, as pictured on the left, might go through a traffic management layer, but they're processed by the NIC cores, possibly transformed in some capacity, maybe decapped, maybe encrypted, maybe decrypted, and then those, those packets are passed on to the host cores. So this means that uh, the NIC cores have direct access uh, to the packets, every single one of them, and uh, you can have fairly low latency packet processing here. Caveat being, every time a packet comes in, a NIC core, an ARM core in this case, would have to touch it. The off-path architecture, however, is different. At the center of all of this is a embedded switch or a fixed function ASIC as we've talked about. This ASIC hardware allows packets to possibly skip the NIC cores. So there is an off chance that those packets will be off path and go directly to the host cores. This could be advantageous when packets that should be directed to the host cores are, are, are directed appropriately, or it could be that uh, certain hardware functions can be performed and there's no need once, the, once a connection is validated to send it to the NIC cores. So why does it really matter, this on-path versus off-path architecture? So on-path smart NICs typically expose a very low-level programming API. They might use an SDK, or some other low-level interface to access hardware, hardware blocks to access packets on a smart NIC. And since you're interacting with a very specific implementation, different vendor, probably different vendors packages would likely require a different software implementation. Off-path smart NICs, however, tend to be more flexible and more programmable. They typically use the same data plane drivers that are used on a, on a regular NIC and on the smart NIC because they both share access to this NIC block that's included and used for both the host side, typically x86, and the smart NIC side, typically ARM. With this common driver capability and common hardware API and car common hardware everything, we like to think, a hardware vendor can give third parties or others an operating system and users can have complete control over their own destiny. There's no need to, no requirement in most cases to have access to a very specific SDK or specific use case in order to satisfy that we do our job, then it's easy for everyone to use. The focus on our, of this talk for both Orr and I will be on off-path smart NICs because Broadcom's Stingray smart NIC and the Mellanox Blue, Mellanox Bluefield smart NICs, excuse me, are both off-path smart NICs. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Orr. And he's gonna talk about some of the data path models that exist for off-path smart NICs. Yes, thank you, Andy. So once we did the distinction between on-pass SmartNIC and off-pass SmartNIC, we've dive a bit into those off-pass SmartNICs. And we'd like to introduce two models for, uh, or mention two models for packet processing, or more generally IO processing later, you'll see that we expand it beyond networking. So the first one we call it, we refer to it as a store and forward. We call it store and forward because each packet goes from the network to the SOC and only then to the host. The packet comes from the network, goes through the NIC interface to the SOC, and then somehow, maybe through PCI or through the NIC again, to the host. Um, this, this has um, this sort of performance compromise, as you'll see for the next uh, model. And the performance would be limited to some extent by the characteristics of the SOC, such as caches, core speeds, and such. Um, on the other hand, because the SOC in off-pass SmartNIC runs a general purpose Linux operating system, you can practically run every packet processing uh, workload that you have. Uh, it would be both the control plane and the data plane on your SmartNIC. Um, common examples are like OpenVSwitch, XDP, 
um, eBPF is fully available on ARM architecture, so it can be either directly eBPF or through XDP, AFX, AFXDP, VP, VPP, and such. This is the storm forward model. The next model, we refer to it as inline. Could you move this slide? <laughs> Thank you. So the in, in, the inline, in the inline forwarding model, as the name suggests, the packets go directly through the NIC without going through the SOC. So we have a control plane and a data plane. The data plane fully goes through the NIC. There is no additional copy and no performance compromise. Um, the, control, the control plane, on the other hand, runs still runs on the SOC. And, um, and the challenge for, for control place applications is to offload, offload the data pass to the hardware. Typical, um, typical characteristics of those, uh, what you would need to offload would be, of course, obviously match in action. Uh, we see also encryption coming up. And uh, the next thing, the next two, two guys in line that we see are compression or, or regular expressions. All, all these, uh, all these uh, modifications or transformations are applied on packet processing workloads that we see uh, today. And more and more of them are uh, already available by nine, by 2020 to be offloaded by, um, with a rich uh, open source uh, um, ecosystem that we'll discuss in, in, a minute, in a minute. So let's look at some examples. Um, we store it forward, as we said, you just, you just take your OVS. This is example for OVS. So OVS, runs on the ARM. Uh, we have the representative model for the Linux NIC switch dev uh, architecture that we uh, kind of uh, described in previous conference. Uh, but all everything goes through the SOC, both the control plane and the data plane. So all packets goes from the host to this switching component, then to the ARM, and then outside to the network and the other way around. So this is OVS with storing forward. The next example, Uh, would be um, something which involves routing, like uh, with FRR or your own BFF beef router, but the concept is the same. The, the packet processing workload is fully programmed on the ARM. Every packet goes from the host through the switching uh, component of the NIC to the ARM, and then the modification can run there. And uh, one usage is, let's say, ECMP, running ECMP on your host, but then you do the ECMP work on your smart NIC and such. Uh, if we go to the inline model, this is something that we is maybe more natural to this to the uh, NetDev crowd, uh, but this time the OVS offload runs uh, is programmed from the smart NIC. So we have the OVS with the representer architecture, and though both companies like Broadcom uh, have TrueFlow and Emelnox rebranded it ASAP, but both these uh, products or, or brands, if you like, are based on the concept of offloading OVS in a very similar manner that you would do it on the host, but do it on the ARM, because the ARM is man the managing the e-switch. If we look, um, next slide. If we look on the open source ecosystem, which is needed for this inline processing, so what we see is that, um, as Andy, Andy mentioned, the, the ARM uh, has a NIC interface. This means that it's, it's actually practically identical, identical interface as what the host sees to some uh, in, a, in, to, in a large manner. So the same APIs and drivers that you would use on your host, you can use on your smart NIC to just access the NIC and manage the e-switch of the NIC. This means that the transition from running on the host and to running on smart NIC is relatively easy. We have uh, data pass offloads uh, in a kernel fashion via TC Flower and also recently with connection tracking technology also through Net, NetFilter and for DPDK based data pass through RTE flow. Again, as we said, further hardware accelerators are introduced by, by SmartNIC vendors and um, are exposed uh, via uh, APIs. So the first two we see kind of ready in the line are the crypto ones. For instance, KTLS and IPsec can be made uh, to run inline already uh, today. And what we see coming up is the need uh, to define those API and offload them for compression and regular expression uh, matching. <clears throat> so
So the next thing we think about whenever we talk about a smart NIC is how am I going to use this? So users will wonder what are the benefits or more to the point, how do I deploy this? So we took a look at uh, OpenStack smart NIC integration. So in, in a legacy installation, which is what I'm now calling everything that's not a smart NIC, Nova or compute and networking or Neutron, those, those agents are both going to run on the host. But in a smart NIC installation, as Orr has already discussed, Neutron is going to run on the ARM cores, or more to the point, the data path is going to run on the ARM cores. So Neutron should be there too. But Nova needs to stay on the server. Now there are some that don't do that. Typically Nova needs to stay on the server. So what we've done so far is we have users who have done this, but quite honestly, more testing is needed to validate that Nova and Neutron can live and any other dependent agents can live happily ever after on separate CPU cores. And though, as I mentioned, there are people who have deployed OpenStack successfully with smart NICs and separated uh, different components into different CPU complexes, ARM versus host, there's currently no turnkey OpenStack solution. You see the frown face, and this is kind of disappointing in some ways, uh, but, this is a fact, and this is the way it is today. One of the things I look towards, and when I think about how there might be better integration in the future, is I look at the fact that Neutron with the networking OVN plugin is gaining lots of popularity. So if you look at fundamentally the OVN architecture, which is pictured on the right, we can see that OpenStack now only needs to communicate with a single database, the OVN northbound DB. That database uh, will communicate with a daemon that will ultimately push config to the OVN southbound DB. Now, any given host that is running OVS will also be running an OVN controller app that will read from the southbound DB and appropriately populate the local uh, OVS database and make sure that flows can be. Uh, programmed correctly, either to hardware or to a software data plane. This architecture is exactly the kind of distributed model that really benefits from smart NICs. So will we get better OpenStack smart NIC in the future? Uh, smart NIC integration in the future? That's it's a good question. Uh, a lot of it will depend on interest, and a lot of it will depend on the desires of those continuing to deploy OpenStack. And probably whether or not my company and Orr's company decide to invest a significant amount in making that happen. The next infrastructure that's so important to think about and is at every, every conference that even isn't just KubeCon is Kubernetes. So this decoupled architecture and in general, the, the, um, the model of Kubernetes might be a better fit for smart picks. Now OpenStack is distributed, but Kubernetes seems to be a little bit more uh, it just seems to be different. It seems like there are a lot more application choices and a lot, a lot of different uh, applications that people might use. One example, uh, in this sort of nominal case, Kube proxy is there to perform IP tables rules, do filtering, and make sure that things get to the right application as needed. This could be a prime candidate to move to a smart name. If the processing of forwarding and filtering rules could be done there, and an application simply uh, had an interface that was a VF or interface that was a VLAN interface, or some way to delineate how this container net dev gets what it needs, this could really be a good option. Another good option would actually be to move an ingress controller all the way to a smart net. And this is exactly what we've done. So we've undergone some testing in the last few weeks to, actually more than that, to move Envoy down to a ARM-based smart NIC and test what it would be like to pass traffic between two applications running on a host if they have to go through uh, Envoy running on ARM cores. So you can see from the diagram, a packet would, would leave application one, traverse through the e-switch, could probably not do much other than look at the proper MAC address to see it arrive on an MDEV representer on the ARM cores. This representer would uh, in turn pass the packets to the ingress Envoy proxy because it would be listening on that device. That Envoy proxy would say, oh, it should go over here. 
and ultimately the routing table would move it to a different MDEV and that packet would, would proceed back to the other application on the host. One of the reasons we decided to address this situation and understand if this is a viable option is that much like cases where OVS in the past was seen as consuming a significant, significant number of cores in virtualization installations, we're now seeing uh, ingress proxies or uh, other service mesh type data planes using a significant number of cores on x86 servers. There are lots of optimizations, lots of packages or lots of projects, lots of companies built around making this better. We decided to take the approach of what if we move on way to the smart man. In this case, what we found is that if you on a standard, fairly generic x86 server of recent generation, if you're using around five or six cores worth of CPU time, just processing uh, traffic via Envoy, that you could successfully offload that traffic to uh, and Stingray, SmartNIC, and successfully relieve that system from having to consume those cores, doing nothing but processing uh, packets and moving them to the right container. So we're going to continue to do this to do this experimentation and do this testing, and I expect more to be reported on this in the future. But these are the types of things we're thinking about when we think about integration. Another piece to consider is that maybe you don't want to use a large framework like OpenStack or Kubernetes. So in this case, in a true open source model, you just want to, everything to get out of your way and you want to manage your device the way you want to manage your device. Many people will, will want to do that. In this case, because we're running Linux and we're able to run any sta you know, standard, standard Linux, if you like, traditional tools that are used on other uh, distributions or any distribution for configuration or for management can be used. Uh, this is also, by the way, this independent management, extremely popular in the world of bare metal server deployments. And this is something that the smart NIC has really enabled. Um, having these separate cores that can do processing are really a benefit to those wanting to deploy bare metal servers. And Or I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Before he does, I'm going to talk about a couple more tests we did and some examples that we, we demonstrate. So if you were a, a typical uh, provider of systems for someone, and particular provider of VMs, you might decide that you want to use a VNF in your infrastructure. So one of your, your VMs that you're running is actually doing nothing but either forwarding or packet transformation, possibly security. And in this case, this is something that's consuming cores and makes your systems less usable for applications because cores are being consumed by this VNF. Well, we have taken the, the, the fairly obvious idea of running this VNF for ARM in a VM on the Stingray SmartNIC, and this can be done. So we have example scripts, uh, and we have uh, full examples uh, in the GitHub link that, should be, that will be available on the slides. And what we've done in this case is provided a sample VM that just has a DPDK, a simple test PMD app that we use for this testing. And this creates a, an Ubuntu cloud-based uh, VM that runs on the smart NIC, can be deployed, it gives you the same benefits that a, that a VNF might give you on a server, but now on the smart NIC. So now if you look at our x86 host that's listed here, we are freed up to do nothing but application development. So we can be sure if our VNF is correct and is running on the smart NIC that it has filtered what we need to filter and the x86 host is free to just host its applications. Additionally, we provided an example of being able to perform some simple smart NIC configuration with Ansible. Again, standard Linux running, Ansible works great. So a full example of this fairly simple solution of running OVS on the ARM cores and having a host that's running VMs is shown here. Also in this picture over to the far right, we see there's just a simple controller that's somewhere else on the network that's able to uh, enter the smart NIC, perform configuration, do setup of OVS and, uh, and, and forward traffic between the wire and between the appropriate VMs. Full example of this also available on the link. I think it's important to not just 
talk about what's possible, but actually show some things that are possible with the Stingray Smart Egg. So we provided those here today. So now I'll turn it over to Orr, and he's going to talk a little bit more about smart nicks and bare metal clouds. Thank you, Andy. The next thing I wanted to, we wanted to look on is take a further steps and think about situations that we refer to them as bare metal clouds, when the, what's, what's available is a server that you don't know what's running there. It could be uh, a legacy server or a legacy storage appliance that may maybe have an older operation system or even a special made operating system. And it doesn't have all the fancy and new things we have on uh, Linux, for example. In this case, um, what, we, what comes into the, into the picture is the ability of SmartNIC using uh, software that runs on the SmartNIC and hardware capabilities to expose uh, common hardware functions to, to this legacy server. And this way, this server does not need to run uh, latest technology uh, drivers and such. In the, for the NIC, NIC part, so we're talking about IO. So IO, IO typically is made of networking and storage. And uh, in the NIC side of things, uh, something which you see coming up is um, a virtual hardware function being planted by the smart NIC on the, on the uh, PCI bus of the, um, of the server. Uh, in the storage case, uh, we, see a case, we see a case of NVMe PC high uh, disk being uh, emulated to the server. In this case, the server does not need to have local storage anymore. And, all the, and, and also they don't need to have the latest uh, NVMe Fabrics driver because they would use, for the Virtio case, they would use the Virtio Net driver, which is available virtually all, all operating systems and the NVMe PCI driver, which is also available on all operating system. And you can also boot from. For the, NIC, for, the, for the smart NIC operator, there's a rich open source facilities to integrate with. Uh, in Virt.io, we're talking about um, the VDPA infrastructure for both kernel and DPDK. And in storage, we talk about the kernel stack or SPDK. Let's move to see a concrete example with Mellanox Bluefield in the next slide. Uh, we have something we call SNAP, which stands for Source Defined Networking Accelerated process Processing. And SNAP is a framework to emulate NVMe local storage on hypervisor on a server and, and connect it to remote storage. If we look on the chart, we can see that on the right side of the chart, the, the server sees an, uh, an NVMe PCI disk and they would run an NVMe standard driver. Those NVMe PCI transactions that would be applied by the, by the server are translated um, into a data pass that runs in the smart NIC. And here again, we have two choices. Cho two choices. The first one is inline. In this case, the hardware can translate NVMe PCI to NVMe over RDMA without going through the, through the uh, NIC calls, without going through the SOC directly to the network after the initial connection establishment. The other case, which is more common, is where uh, the smart NIC operator would like to intervene, to intercept, to modify uh, the, the storage traffic of the server. Uh, let's take a case where the fabric, the fabric operator or the smart NIC operator, they would want to use NVMe over TCP because that's their, their storage infrastructure, for instance. So we call it a snap proxy. And this would be store and forward because the NVMe traffic, the, MV, the emulated NVMe PCI traffic would go to the SOC and then a target would run and would translate it to initiator of NVMe TCP, a storage proxy. On the left side, we see a Mellanox NIC, but in the more general case, as I said, it could be a Virtio NIC. It could be either the vendor NIC or VDPA with Virtio. And again, in, the, in this case, it can be either later store and forward or inline. But in the end of the day, we have this component that Andy mentioned, the, the embedded switch of, this, of the NIC, which have to deal with all the traffic. So here comes the software model that we've been building over the last years of the representals. And then you have storage traffic, TCP IP traffic, but it's all Ethernet frames and it all switch inside and is inside, outside and inside. This is actually quite a complex configuration, but we, find, uh, we find it very compelling.
Now to conclude our uh, presentation today, uh, I would like to again highlight uh, the last part of bare metal provisioning, which look promising both to users and also for, for smart, to users, smartic operators and NIC vendor to express their excellency and their um, uh, highly performance hardware offload through those provisioning which uh, will be simple for the host to use because the host would only run some legacy uh, uh, driver. We see uh, two, two major use cases. A case where the server operators could call to control the smart NIC. I think people call it the virtualization use case. And there's the case when the oper network operator controls the smart NICs. This is the bare metal. Now to you, Randy. Thanks, Or. So the key for both Broadcom, Stingray, and Mellanox Bluefield is that we want these NICs to be open programmable NICs that are simple to use. They must be capable of running open source operating systems. They must be capable of running open source applications. Use of standard automation tools so people can do whatever they want to with them is a requirement. And ultimately, either full integration or at least complementary uh, applications or OpenStack, Kubernetes really does aid the adoption. And these distributed frameworks are really, really just the, the right way to go when you're considering distributing your system even further by adding uh, a server inside your server, if you will. So the nature of these maybe doesn't make it so that there's a going to be an, an instant full, full requirement or full turnkey system for it. But we really feel like Going forward, there are lots of different ways to use these open programmable smart NICs in, in ways to aid uh, your data center um, performance and uh, really find better ways to use those, uh, uh, those precious cores for doing uh, important work. Thank you. Thank you. We have some questions. I see Taras has a question. Is everybody ready? Yes. Uh, so uh, basically, what, what what seems to me that we are taking the course uh, and saying you can have some extra course somewhere else that you can use and run your. Hey, uh, hang on for a second. Yes. Can you mute? Yeah. All right, sorry, guys. go ahead again. Yes, so it, it seems that we are taking the general purpose course and putting them on a special uh, PCIe card and saying you can, or you can run your own application and uh, offload or do some processing on those cores that, because that might be more efficient. What do you think? Can we ever be in a position that the, those kind of accelerators, we can tell like that, will have that some... Uh, standard level of um, management because I've seen that in one example we can have the SSH to the NIC or uh, we can use Ansible. What do you think about in kernel stuff? For example, I wrote an eBPF or I don't know I wrote I want to do uh, some other new protocol, uh, that, um, maybe not new but existing one uh, processing on those cores. And so I'm taking the either Broadcom or Mellanox NIC, and that just works from kernel. Do you think it can ever happen? Or this is just, I should always use some user space, maybe proprietary or open source tools to do whatever I want, but specifically for my case? Uh, yeah, I think it's possible because it's possible today. So you can run, uh, right now you can run anything after 420 and it'll boot on Stingray. And I think uh, Orr has mentioned that all of the patches for their uh, Mellanox Bluefield NIC is also available um, open source. And I think they have uh, one or two more, I think he said, uh, blocks, SOC blocks that need to be pushed upstream. But I mean, right right now, you could go build a system right now. I'm going to say right now a few more times. Uh, you could go build a completely open source solution and run it on these cards and control your own destiny. I mean, my, my, my job is to have no SDKs, none of this stuff. So... Yeah, and you can run BPF on it now. So if you want to do that, that's, that's, a, that's a thing. So there's a couple more questions along those lines. I think the summary question, Andy, is not whether you can run it or not. It's the fact that 
from a model perspective, if I run everything on host codes, offloading it, we can argue whether or not it gives you the benefit or not, because in the net it may not, but maybe topically and separation of concerns it might. But it does introduce new complexities in terms of the UB of that used to run in the kernel now is running maybe split or maybe somewhere else. But also there are some very specific questions from Salil and somebody else about, uh, Sergey about uh, VM migration and, and the complexity that it comes with because SRRB already has that, wouldn't this make it worse? Yeah, and you know the example we provided definitely used SRIOV for um, we're talking about the, the VNF there, but there's no actual compelling reason why you had to use uh, SRIOV if you didn't want to. I mean, you could, it's clearly there's going to be some efficiency gain there. You're not spending time just switching packets, but I mean, we haven't tested this extensively. The, the, the challenge right now, I think that exists with SmartNICs is that they're, um, they're heavily used in the clouds, let's say. So, and, and this is not a fabrication. This is real. So the question becomes, does everyone else want to gain those same benefits that, that clearly people who are using them in clouds are getting? And uh, both the, the NIC that Broadcom has and the NIC that Mellanox has gives people that chance. So um, I get the management aspect, not only from the individual SRIOV based things, I get the idea that um, things will be split a little bit differently than they might have been um, and that's a legit concern, and we need to address those as they become harder for people to use. Okay. Um, I'm uh, not seeing any questions that I think we haven't addressed. Anybody who thinks there is something that we haven't talked about yet? I tried to type fast during the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so exactly. So, and, and we, need to, we need to keep moving, so maybe we'll move along and... Uh, uh, just, just one question, if you sure. So, is Linux the right OS for this? Was that Jamal? Uh, it sounded like it's, it's somebody masquerading as Jamal. The real person is it's no Linux. What, what are you going to run down there? While loop, DPDK, OpenBSD, NetBSD, NetBSD. Are you going to run TC? You certainly can. I mean. <laughs> I, I don't, no, I mean, like, honestly, like the same IP block that, that for networking for both of these cards that's used on x86. So if there's TC flower support for MLX5 and there's TC flower support for BNXTEN, then yeah, you can run, you could run offload. So, or if you just want to run straight TC and do everything in software no, or, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, so my, my, basically my concern is do you, I, I would think this would be very high performance in order to offload the host, right? So you don't want to go and run a full server software there. You probably just need something that uh, processes real fast and uses the offload capabilities as opposed to running things on the CPU. Jamal, but Jamal just, just the point with the off pass. I, I right. think you maybe missed that. So if you're an on pass smart Nick, means that every packet goes through your CPU, maybe Linux or maybe you think about um, a bare metal environment in your smartly because you don't want to, you think the operating system is too heavy to process a packet like you do in NPU, right? But in this model of off pass, the packets do not go through the SmartNIC course. And that's kind of the essence of our presentation today. Um, that well, you can, you, you, are, you have a, you have a, you have a, you have a certain sets of hardware offloads that you program. And I accept Tom's uh, comment that control pass and data pass are maybe less uh, um, different than we maybe comes from this presentation. Uh, Andy also referred to that in the chat and also myself. But but you have a certain set of, uh, of hardware knobs you can program. You have a switch, uh, and hardware switch that is programmed to deal with the packets. And you have a crypto offload and compression offload and regex and who knows what's coming up. And you are programming all those guys to handle the packets. They are, of course, typically not running operating systems. Those hardware pieces, right? Uh, I, I think we're going to have to stop here, right? I think this, okay. this is, we are we are getting into a philosophical question. There are advantages of all of the above, right? 
um, and, and there are benefits to, I mean, running an embedded lightweight Linux because you can move applications around. There is benefits to running something much tighter. So let's take that since we have happy hour, which may not actually be an hour anymore, maybe more like 10 seconds, but uh, we are currently one entire presentation behind. So let's keep moving forward. <laughs> 